Donc, euh, bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for sticking around. I'll present you today um, uh, the kind of like uh, a wrap up of like uh, this year uh, evolution of our project under the EGP program, which is entitled Ring of Fire Reconstructing Long Term Environmental Records to Support Regional Assessment. Um, basically, we're trying to develop uh, tools that will help to support regional assessment and, and specifically tools that would be geoscientific tools that would be uh, adapted uh, to um, try to understand cumulative effect in the region of the Ring of Fire. So why the Ring of Fire uh, region? It's, uh, what is it? It's a large mineral deposit of nickel, copper, zinc, and chromium, as well as platinum group uh, metals located in Northern Ontario and uh, in one of the world's largest peatland system, which is obviously very sensitive, both to climate change and to uh, anthropogenic stresses. So there is like a lot of additional knowledge that is required um, to, 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 um, to, to uh, acquire for, in order to understand environmental conditions, both pre-mining and also in order to try to understand what could this system become uh, once uh, mining started. So the pre-mining knowledge that we need is, is really like understand the natural presence of uh, and the behavior of uh, metalloids uh, that needs to be carefully assessed. And also this natural presence, we need to understand how it, in, it evolves uh, over time and specifically in response to climate change in kind of a like, cumulative effect aspect. And also we have to think about like since the Anthropocene era, like what type of anthropogenic or remote anthropogenic stresses uh, could we, could we uh, see and, and, and gather from, from this environment. And then obviously the post mining initiation of um, the, 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 the evolution of the system post mining, like this system hasn't been mined yet, so we don't have anything uh, to work with. And, and that would be more like the type of, of work uh, that we've just seen um, uh, in the presentation, a great presentation from, from Alex. Uh, and there we would like to understand change in groundwater flow dynamic, especially in a peatland system and, and the geochemical fate of metalloids in the surface storage uh, of um, uh, rock uh, mining waste rock. So the project members are uh, all there. It, this project is co-led by Nicolas Benoit and myself with a great help of management and, and and some uh, great uh, dendrochronological input from Joël Marion as well. We have collaborator across divisions uh, at the GSC, as well as some uh, collaborators uh, within ENERCAN and also uh, in academia. Um, the activities uh, on this project, uh, basically we have three types of activity and I'm gonna talk more today. I really wanna focus on the activity on the pre-mining context uh, and so, our approach to try to look at environmental archives in order to understand the pre-mining context of um, a, um, a site that would, be, would, would look like the Ring of Fire. And when I say a site that will look like a Ring of Fire, it's because basically we're not able to go to the Ring of Fire due to uh, the COVID situation. It was complicated to travel up north in this remote area for obvious reasons. And so we decided to uh, select an analog context or what we consider a good analog site uh, for the Ring of Fire, which is a chromite deposit uh, in Northern Quebec, uh, at a site that is called Menalik Lake. Uh, I'll show you a bit of what we've done in terms of field campaign, and I will show you what is really instrumental to start interpreting potential pro proxy in our environmental archive is establishing the chronology. So I'll show you that. The two other um, activities uh, will be reported in the GGP program. So the pre-mining context, uh, here is a site. I don't know if you see my mouth, my pointer. Um, that would be the Ring of Fire in Northern Ontario and you just cross the James Bay and you arrive uh, here in Northern Quebec, Menarik Lake. Uh, remote area close to uh, the Billy Diamond Highway and uh, some of the big hydro reservoir and close by Rad Radisson, but otherwise a pretty remote area as well. The lake is like uh, all in length from west to east, roughly like 10, 10 kilometer long. And the actual mineralized bedrock in chromium is right there. It's a peridotite uh, bedrock. 
And there are like uh, several locations where there is uh, outcrop of this mineralized bedrock that reaches the lake and the surrounding environment. Like I said, our approach is really to look at different type of environmental archive. And I, I think what is also interesting and what we're trying to do is to uh, try to have uh, to, to cross compare this archive and what they actually can tell us and try to understand uh, the, the, the proxy that are in it. And we want to co-localize the sampling of those archives and have complementary chronological scales. The idea is to try to go back in the past and, and, re, um, and, and reach some past climatic anomalies that we can use as analog to current climate change or that we can use as uh, anomalies that can help us understand how the system would react in a cumulative effect aspect. So different types of, of proxy can be found and that we choose uh, up there. We have uh, extensive peat, so we're gonna, we did like some peat coring, which was a chronological um, uh, reach that is like thousands of years. Lake sediment, depending uh, on the lake and the sediment accum accumulation rate, we, you, we can go from hundreds to thousands of years and how deep you can actually core as well. And then tree rings, really in this region, we're in the boreal forest. We're looking at our uh, mighty black spruce and, and we can really reach like hundreds, two hundreds if we're really lucky, uh, just due to the natural recurrence of forest fire up there, which is like roughly 70 years, I believe. So again, uh, we want to use those uh, as climate proxy and as, as, as a temporal like, constraint uh, going back in time and then see if we can measure any chromium loading in those ones and, 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 and try to establish a potential link between them. We're also going to test and develop a new uh, indicator of forest fire intensity with our colleague Jason Ahad and Scott Abditch, uh, his PhD student. Uh, looking here more at lake sediment and organic uh, proxy. And this is, would be more in, in, in an attempt to try to understand how forest fire can also remobilize uh, metalloid and chromium specifically. So field work, here we are. Um, that, that is the uh, east end of the lake. As you can see, you can recognize this pinkish uh, color. That's the bedrock, the peridotite bedrock that is uh, mineralized in chromium. And we sample different type of sample, rock samples uh, that we uh, hope are um, representative of the, of the bedrock mineralogy uh, to try to understand where our elements are coming from. Uh, we have trees as well. Three different sites of trees have been uh, collected, two here and one more remote on the north shore of the lake. Uh, we have different uh, surface sediment sample in the river right there and around uh, the, the lake shore right there two coring sites uh, in, the, in the lake uh, with uh, a different uh, type of sediment that are collected. The depot, depot center is right there. That is our actual uh, archive. And then several peat uh, site collection. Uh, and we try to have a couple sites that are actually close to an outcrop uh, that is mineralized in chromium. That's our nice coring platform, example of sediment cores right there. Uh, roughly 70 centimeter of lake sediment core collected at a depth of 20 meter roughly at the, at the depot center there. And then one nice mineralotrophic peat sample right there. So for the chronologies, we have obviously to use different types of, of methods uh, for the different archives. Uh, peat and lake sediment are usually dated, of course, radiocarbon is a, is a nice tool that has been used for a long time. But we date them as well for with lead to 10, cesium 137, 226 radium, 241 americium. Uh, some of those uh, radioactive isotopes are used really as just a geochronometer to really build the age model. Some of them are used as chronostratigraphic marker, like the cesium 137 uh, and, and the, the americium that tells us kind of like uh, help us to validate our uh, age depth model. And then we tested different age model technique. Uh, over the past few years, there was a several kind of a boom in, in, in the type of age model that you can do for lake sediment and as well as for peat core. Um, uh, we used to use a tree classic model before uh, and for the, for the past 40 years, but now with the, the advance of uh, computing and, and the application of Bayesian technique, we're able to, to have a better um, understanding or more conservative understanding of, of the uncertainties uh, with the age model. 
So I'll show you that. And then the tree ring counting, the nice thing with that, and this is kudo to, uh, to Joel, who has all the, the, the knowledge for that. But the, the great thing for that is that uh, in addition to having an absolute datation on your black spruce population, you also right out of the bat, you have uh, right there a climatic proxy with the simply the width of uh, the tree rings. So the results for the lake are right there. Uh, here we have a nice linear uh, uh, decay for our lead 210 uh, plotted in a logarithmic, logarithmic scale, which is a good thing that tells us that we'll have a, a good age model and good sediment accumulation. Here you see the cesium-137 that I told you we're using as a chronostratigraphic marker, and it does peak uh, at uh, one place here, uh, kind of, oops, kind of the same than the americium, although this one is a bit more blurred. Uh, we apply two, several age models, but I show you like constant rate of supply, the classic age model, and the actual Bayesian version of this constant rate of supply in blue right there. What you can see here is that the red, the classical model, seems to be very nice and narrow in terms of uncertainties in the dating right there. Uh, here you have the, the depth, and here you have the dating. Um, and then it kind of shows like a huge trump at, at the bottom of the core uh, where you actually have up to 200 a year of error, which is kind of, uh, kind of too much. Um, if you look at your Bayesian model, you have a bit more uh, bigger error at shallow depth, uh, but seems to be more realistic. And then you have more constrained error uh, at the bottom of the core right there, at the bottom of the section that we're analyzed for like 10. And if we look at our um, cesium-137 replotted here, we see that it's plotting right at the 1963 uh, date uh, that is uh, um, computed by the age model, the Bayesian age model. And that is actually the date of the maximum fallout of uh, thermonuclear bomb uh, derived uh, 137 cesium. So that is actually validating our Bayesian model. And that tells us that we have a reliable age model that covers the Anthropocene up to 1850. And the fact that we have lower error down there tells us that we'll have probably a better anchoring of our radiocarbon dates that we're planning to, uh, to have soon on the remaining 35 centimeter of the sediment core. So giving us a, a longer chronology even than just uh, the covering of the Anthropocene roughly. For the peat, uh, here you see two different sites uh, with those kind of like square boxes representing our, uh, our lead to 10 uh, measurement on the peak. You'll see that we don't really have a decay of the lead to 10. Sorry, like those graphs are reversed. You have the depth here, the age here, and the lead to 10 here. Um, and you see that it's kind of all over the place. And it's probably due to the fact that we cored uh, the peat that we have there, which are mineralotrophic uh, cores. Uh, peat, sorry, probably with like some variation of um, of water table that may have like uh, kind of uh, smudge our lead to ten uh, profile. So that's that's okay because we still see that past twenty centimeter we don't have lead to ten activity. So that tells us what we reach background. So probably more than uh, 100, 150 years, and then we have our radiocarbon dates that are saving us and then give us like a nice, uh, a nice uh, age model uh, with bigger uncertainty, of course, than lead to 10. But that tells us that we are covering uh, 1500 to 2000 year with our uh, peat sites. So we'll be able to explore some uh, climatic anomaly like the medieval climatic optimum uh, and their effect on natural metallism ability. The other interesting thing I, th I think, and I was surprised about that maybe because I'm new in, in peat, but it's that our first 20 centimeter of peat are actually pretty much the same resolution uh, in terms of, of age than uh, the Anthropocene portion of our lake sediment core. So that's going to that's gonna allow us to do nice comparison and cross comparison between the two uh, different archives. And then the tree ring here, you can see here the different um, tree rings uh, as an example with different dates. And you see the variation of the size of your tree rings as well. Uh, that is a nice and important in order to uh, calculate the growth index right there. So here we have two sites dated so far um, that are actually agreeing with a regional uh, reference a site uh, in terms of growth index and, and datation. So that's reassuring. And we can see right there that we have two anomalies, one that is specific to MK02, which is the site that is on the North shore of the lake 
and the other one uh, where it's, it's actually, you can see it in both sites and also in the reference site. So we are kind of speculating that this one in 1990s is probably related to the impact of the Pinatubo volcanic eruption uh, that is so uh, more of a global impact uh, in terms of reducing the growth index. And that has been seen in other location in, in Northern Quebec. And then this site, we think that this might be an actual more of a local uh, effect and that could be like a forest fire that would have like reduced uh, locally like the, the growth uh, of those trees at sites uh, MK02. And interestingly enough, and that's where it starts to get exciting and where like our archives are like uh, collaborating together uh, in the peat sample, uh, peat site that is on the north shore of the lake, we're actually finding charcoal at the layer that are around circa 1920 and also a change of vegetation remains. So um, keep, um, Keep, uh, keep listening to the news that we're going to see uh, on the lake sediment cores. So that's pretty much it. So we, we basically complete the, the field work. We have really good preliminary chronologies that are actually agreeing between each other uh, with various time resolution and that will allow us to put in perspective the proxy profiles uh, that we are expecting to, uh, to uh, look at uh, this year. And, uh, and look at the, the, the chromium mobility in the environment. So we're on track to bring insight on the sensitivity of these different archives on the long-term evolution of metal in this type of environment. And with that, I'm done. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now or, or later. <laughs>